Hello, class. Well, we're down to our last three lectures, and there were some other topics that I wanted to cover. Um, I'm just happy that I've gotten through really 99% of the material that I would have covered in an in-person class. And, and that's what I wanted, because this is an important class really for your career, not so much going forward in electrical engineering, because it's a fundamental course for engineering, not so much a fundamental course for electrical engineering. But uh, I hope that along the way, I've given you a lot of uh, things that you can use in you know, electrical engineering as well as uh, mechanical engineering or, or anything else. What I wanted to do today was I wanted to look at, uh, let me see where 10, let's, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So right here, this is going to be our beam. This is a little more complicated. Uh, it's still a uh, simply supported beam, right? But um, now what I want to do is I want to put a uniform distribution of weight. And of course, this uniform distribution of weight, am I, am I recording? Let me just make sure I'm recording. Yep, yeah, I'm recording. Um, or am I? Yes. Do I see green there? Yes, okay, I do. But uh, my microphone might not be perfect. Anyway. Uh, so I'm going to put a uniform distribution, and that uniform distribution is really the weight of this uh, walkway or, or bridge or, or whatever uh, you want to think of it as. Now, this is going to be the main, it's actually uh, the, a, a walkway between two buildings is what I've, uh, I've made here. So this is going to be 4,400 pounds per foot. Yes, I, I am working in the British gravitational system and we can use our um, conversion factor right when we get to the end. I also want to put in a safety factor of four. Now why am I doing that? Why such a high safety factor? Because this walkway is a covered walkway between two buildings. It's going to be up about eight floors, right? And the design that I'm using, let's go right to five, is assuming, right? It's assuming that only a um, hundred people will be on this hundred foot long walkway. So this is uh, uh, 50 feet right from here to here, and then 50 feet from here to here. Now, why am I putting in a safety factor of four? And in fact, the safety factor for something like this, right? If you're, you're talking about a, you know, something that's in your car, that if one of the things breaks, uh, you know, your, your car will stop. Oh my God, the car stops on the side of the road, right? So that's one problem. Uh, but, but what would be the safety factor if we were working on jet engines that are flying across the Atlantic Ocean? Right? Those things can't fail, right? So we'd have a safety factor that would be more, you know, like, like eight. And we'd have redundant systems, just like your brake system in your car, right? You have two separate reservoirs, one for the front brakes, one for the back brakes, just so that both of the uh, two <laughs> brake systems don't go out at the same time, right? That's why we have redundancy in design like your brake system. Uh, and we also use higher, I mean, if this were to fail, let's say that I'm assuming that there's only going to be about 100 people on the bridge at 170 pounds per, per person, right? So that comes to 17,000 pounds. I, I, assuming that all 100 of those people go and stand right in the middle of the walkway because they want to see the parade right underneath. So they're all standing, all 100 are standing right in the middle. But what if uh, something that we, we could not foresee or, or we did not foresee was that there was a huge parade and instead of 100 people being on that 100 foot walkway, we had a thousand people, 
Well, that's going to change that quite a bit, isn't it? That's going to make that 170,000 pounds. And so we're, we're, we're working with something that's very higher there. And so that's what I want, want to impress on you as well. The different situations require different uh, safety factors, uh, especially when you're talking about something that could result in loss of life. And this, and this would. I mean, if something goes wrong in your car, you have to pull over to the side of the road, probably not going to result in loss of life. But if this thing were to collapse and fall eight floors, everybody on this is going to die. So we have to use a much higher uh, safety factor. So I just, I just want to point that out uh, in this. And in fact, I've already put that in here. We're going we're gonna to see that uh, later on. We're going to use steel uh, for this so we know what our maximum sh uh, normal stresses are, you know, for steel and everything else. And, what I want to do is I want to look at uh, my shear force and bending moment diagrams first. Now, what I'm also going to do is I'm also, you know, because we'll get the shear force and the bending moment diagrams uh, drawn up. Let's just put my bending moment and my shear stress up there. I'm just going to turn on, uh, well, actually, uh, even with the ambient light here, it seems like it's good enough, but I'll... I'll turn on my overhead lights too, just to make sure that that's, uh, wow, that is really bright now. So uh, uh, maybe I didn't need those yet. Uh, that, yeah, that, that looks okay. All right, um, so this is my shear force and bending moment diagram and we wanna figure out, out what that is. Now we've got a couple things here. We've got a point load right in the middle and then we've got a uniform load going all the way across at the same time as the point load. How is that gonna manifest itself on my shear force diagram? Well, let's just go through the process, right? The first thing we do is we sum all of the forces in the y direction equal to zero. So I've got, uh, um, R sub A, I, I tend to put R sub A on the left side and R sub B on the right side, but uh, R sub A plus R sub B minus 17,000 pounds minus 4,400 pounds times 100 feet. Right, two more zeros on that. That gives me 440,000 pounds, right? So when we sum all of these together, this gives us our first equation, R sub A plus R sub B is going to equal 457,000 pounds. Now, if you want, you could, uh, you know, figure out what that is in uh, Newtons or, you know, because we know what the conversion factor is. We know that 4.45 Newtons equals one pound, don't we? I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this one. <laughs> I thought I needed more room. All right, so that's the first thing that we are gonna do. And then the second thing that we're going to do, just like always, is to sum the moments. And we'll do the moments uh, about, uh, actually, I think I summed the moments. No, that's right, about B. So let's uh, put the moments here. We've got two different moments then. We've got one that's 17,000 pounds right? And that's turning in the positive. So I've got a uh, positive 17,000 pounds, right? Times 50 feet, right? We also have this uh, distribution right here. You know, I think I'll turn it on because uh, it's like cloudy and then it's bright. It's cloudy and it's bright. And I need a little more uniformity. Uh, so that's good because it's cloudy and anyway. So uh, as we sum the forces about there, we know that that's going to be a positive moment, right? Turning it counterclockwise. You know, this one here too, uh, where would I put? Where is the centroid of this rectangular cross section? I think everybody can see the centroid is right in the middle, right? So I really put all 440,000 pounds right in the middle too, 
Okay, so plus 440,000 pounds, I don't know if I'll get that in there, times 50 feet. Hmm, that didn't look too good. Uh, plus, now let's do R sub A. Now this is going to be a, uh, I shouldn't put a plus minus, R sub A, right? Because it's gonna be clockwise rather than counterclockwise times 100 feet. So there we go. And with this, the summation, of course, that equals zero. So we can easily take R sub A out. So we know that R sub A, right, is going to equal 50 times 17,000 plus 50 times, uh, you know, can't we take the 50 out of there, the 50 feet, because it's the 50 feet for both and just add those two together and say that that is 457,000 pounds. So 457,000 pounds times 50 feet. And that gives us uh, 22.85 times 10 to the six uh, foot pounds, right? Oops, excuse me divided by uh, 100 feet. So that tells us that R sub A, uh, let me, divided by 100, so that tells us that R sub A is 228,500 pounds. Now you're probably all saying, okay, okay, I, I know it's 457 uh, pounds, and so uh, 457,000 um, minus 228,500 uh, is going to give me 228,500, and of course that's exactly what we would expect. Right, so both of them, because it's symmetrical about both of the two sides, so we would expect that. Now, so what we know is that this thing is going to go up, right, 228,000. So this point right here is going to be plus 228,500 pounds, right there. And now how's it going to change? Well, it's going to change linearly, isn't it? Because this is a constant. And if I integrate a constant, uh, it's going to be a, uh, and this is negative, right? Because it's all pushing down. So that's negative. And so I know that I've got 4,400 pounds per foot is going to be my slope of the line. I'm going to draw this line right like that. That's supposedly a straight line. <laughs> and then we want to go down 17,000, right? And then we want to keep going down, straight line again. And then we're going to go back up 228,500, right? So, so this, I haven't drawn this to scale because uh, obviously 228,000 is a lot larger. I've left this here because I wanted to show you, uh, you know, what the 17,000 was. Even though the 17,000, you'd hardly even be able to see it if I drew this to scale. But here we go. We've got those two things. Did I? Oh, my God. <laughs> this is supposed to go, go down to here. Sorry about that. Uh, but... That's why I have my correct type here too. There we go. It's like it never happened. <laughs> there we are. And those are straight lines. Uh, so there we go. Yeah, it looked a little larger <laughs> than I thought. So there we are. Uh, and and uh, of course, that's the cross section underneath. So we can easily now figure out what the area under the curve is right? Because in both of these, we really have a triangle and a rectangle, don't we? So we've got this rectangle down here, and then we've got the triangle above it. And we've got this rectangle down here, and then we've got the triangle above it. So we can easily figure out what the area is under that curve, 
right? And in fact, I, I'm going to write this, the area under the curve. So the first thing we want to look at is we want to look at the, the triangle, right? And we know that this, by the way, is a positive slope. This is a negative slope. So we know we have to go up and then we have to go down. Up to this point, down from that point. So we, we know that. Um, but this is a changing slope, isn't it? It's a changing slope. So if this is linear, then this here will have to be parabolic. That's right, it's gonna have to be parabolic. And, but but we've, we've got a parabolic component in there and we also have a linear component in there too, don't we? Let's just find out where it, it, it is supposed to be when it gets up to here. I wanna find the total area under that curve. So area under the curve, under uh, shear force curve. Let's just do that together. All right, so I have uh, 8,500 here, right? This point right here is gonna be 8,500. And this point down here is gonna be minus 8,500. So we know that our, our rectangle is gonna be 8,500 high by 50 feet long. So let's do that. 8,500 pounds by 50 feet, right? Okay, now how about this? This is a lot larger. This is gonna be 228,500 minus 8,500, right? Because it's the triangle up here. So it's 220,000, so plus, one half, because that's what a triangle is, one half base times height, right? So one half times 220,000 times 50 feet. And we wanna take that to the one half. Now that is all of that uh, on, on left side of center. So that's what we've done. We found all of that. So we know what our thing is going to look like there and, or, or what our value is. I'm going to draw how it would look. And that's what I uh, want to do after this. But um, let's figure out what that value is. So 8,500 times 50 plus 0.5 times 200 and 20,000 times 50. And I get 5.925, excuse me, 5.925 times 10 to the six. Uh, and then this, of course, we're, I say area, but we're really multiplying pounds by uh, feet. So this is gonna be foot pounds. All right. So, yes, actually that's what I uh, ended up getting too. So this point right here, how do we get to this point? Well, that is a linear slope, isn't it? Coming right up to here. Now, does that go to zero? No, so we know that this up here is not gonna be horizontal. It still is going to have a little slope going into it, right? And you know, this coming out of it, it's still gonna have a little, a little negative slope too, right? Coming out of it, it's not gonna be horizontal. And we know that this has got to be parabolic. So we know that the slope has gotta be larger here and it's gotta be smaller here. So large slope means that it's almost vertical. So this is how it looks, like that. Yeah. And then this is how it comes down, like this, right? It's not vertical to start off with, it's not infinity, and it's not zero here. So it's neither, um, 
anyway, that's not the point we really need. The, 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 the thing that we really need is the fact that this is 5.925 times 10 to the six uh, foot pounds, right? And that's what we're, that's what we're interested in. Um, and that's what our, our, our maximum, and this equals our maximum bending moment, right? So since we know sigma equals my over i, we've got m. So m for this, uh, m max for this is going to be 5.925 times 10 to the 6 foot pounds. Now we can change that into uh, British gra or, or into metrics system too, can't we? And in fact, that's what I, I want to do because the uh, thing that I'm going to use for this, the, the I-beam I'm going to use to keep that up is going to be an I-beam <clears throat> that uh, is going to be a, 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 a non-symmetrical. Right, now, that's what I want to do. I want to give you an I beam that is a little bit non-symmetrical this time. We're still going to use our uh, five centimeters, right? Like we did the last time. So the web thickness is going to be five centimeters. Um, I'm still going to cross hatch it off and uh, look at it as three different rectangles. We don't know where the neutral axis is, but I'm gonna put the neutral axis down here. And I, I, the reason I'm, I'm drawing it now, rather than finding it and putting it someplace, is I'm saying the neutral axis definitely isn't going to be in the middle, right? So this is going to be 15 centimeters. This down here is still my original 25 centimeters. So, you know, we still know how to get most of these things, but this is going to be different, isn't it? You know, in the middle here, I, I, I'm going to make this 20 uh, centimeters like we did before, but we're not going to be putting that right in the middle anymore. It's definitely going to be below uh, the middle of that center section, isn't it? Does everybody see that? Because the centroid of this, because this is much smaller than this, is going to, the centroid is going to be closer to the bottom uh, than it is to the top, right? So, um, so that's good. <laughs> and we can uh, quickly figure out, now we have to figure out two things. We gotta figure out Y, and we gotta figure out I. And you know, to find Y max, where is Y max going to be? Y max is gonna be here, isn't it? Right, Y max, because look at the bottom. Right, the distance to the bottom is going to be much less than the distance to the top because we've got our centroid that's below the middle of that I beam. Let's figure out a couple things. First of all, we want to figure out what Y uh, bar is going to be, right? So we want to sum up all of the individual ones that are in there. In fact, I should probably do this over, over here. So Y bar times A total is going to equal the sum of all of y sub i, a sub i, uh, i equals one to n uh, here. So let's just add all of those up. Uh, that I can write that down someplace. So um, I've got the bottom one here. I think everybody can see that if this is still like before, like the last lecture that we had, if these are still five centimeters, the, the centroid, right, of that bottom part is gonna be 2.5 centimeters. So uh, 2.5 centimeters uh, times the area of that, which five times is 125 square centimeters, right? Uh, boy, that is, <laughs> I don't really have a lot of room here, do I? So I'm going to put it down here. Just a second. Let me actually, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to draw a line. Uh, so plus, uh, and then we come up here, and what, what have we got? We've got, uh, this is going to be 5 centimeters, then 10 centimeters, so it's going to be 15 centimeters. Uh, the top one is going to obviously, uh, you know, throw us. Uh, times 20 times 5. 
So that's uh, 100 square centimeters. And then plus the third one, uh, which is going to be uh, uh, five times 15, which is 70, well, let's get the, let, let, let's figure out the distance to that first. So I've got five and I've got 20, that's 25 plus two and a half, that's 27 and a half. So 27.5 centimeters, right? And then times the area of this, well, that's five times uh, 15, so that's just 75 square centimeters, right? And so we have all of those and we know what the cross-sectional area is. So Y bar, let's just add all of these up, 2.5 times uh, 125, is 312.5, so 312.5 centimeters cubed plus 100 or 1500 centimeters cubed plus 27.5 times 75 is 2062. 2062. Point five, and all of that divided by the total cross-sectional area. That's 125 plus 100 plus 75, so 125 and 75 is 200 plus that 300, so that's 300 square centimeters, right? So Y bar for the entire cross-section, and, and what would we expect it to be? We'd expect it to be below 15, wouldn't we? And I'm going to tell you exactly what that is. Uh, 312.5 plus 1500 plus 2062.5 equals divided by 300 gives me 12.9166, but I'm going to say 12.2. There we go. So 12.2 centimeters, and everybody can see that this, uh, this the, that, that's the Y bar for that, and that's 12.2 centimeters. You know, what does Y max then become, right? You know, I didn't get any uh, drink. Just a second, I'm, I'm gonna just get a, uh, a water. Okay, I'm back. I got a little water, because, <laughs> I get a bit parched in the morning. I've had a couple cups of coffee, and then I sit down. And I always like to have some water uh, just in case. So Y max now is from Y bar, right? This is Y bar, and we found out what Y bar is. So we want to go all the way up to the top now because that's 12.2 centimeters from the bottom. This is my 12.2 centimeters, right? And we know that this 525, that's 30 high. So 30 minus 12.2 is 17.8. So 17.8 centimeters is Y max. And let's put that in there too. So Y max equals 17.8 centimeters. So we've got two of the three things to determine the stress the maximum stress inside that beam, right? You know, we know where the beam is going to uh, break though, don't we? The beam along the, le the, the, the length is going to break right here because that's where the highest moment of inertia is, isn't it? And so that's the thing, we, we can tell. You know, also, where is this going to break? Is it gonna break on top or bottom? Well, Y is further away on top, isn't it? So if the loading is, uh, is the same all there, it, it's going to break right at the top here. So in the cross section of the beam, it's going to break at the very top. In the cross section of, of the loading, it's going to break right in the middle. Does everyone understand now why, uh, you know, why we, we've got that? Okay, so we've got Y max, got that. The only thing that we have to find out now is we have to find out what I, I is for the cross section of the beam. So we have to find out the moment of inertia about the centroid of all three of these, right? 
and then we're going to move them all to the middle. Now, this time, this one in the middle is going to have to move a little bit, isn't it? It's going to use the parallel axis theorem too, unlike the last example problem that we did, because this has to move all the way down to the neutral axis, this moves to the neutral axis, and this moves to the neutral axis. So let's find out their centroidal uh, uh, moments of inertia. So I'm going to say that the total, I'm just going to do this because we're, I think we're all ready for this. Let's do one, two, three. So I'll call this, let me get another color pen. I'll call this one, I'll call this two. Well, you can't see those too well. I, let's use, uh, I'll use blue. I'm going to say that's one and that's two and that's three. All right, one, two, three, and we're gonna run them all together. We're gonna use the parallel axis theorem as we do it, because we've gotta use the parallel axis theorem on, on each one of these. So the first thing is gonna be BH cubed over 12, right? Isn't that the moment of inertia for a rectangle? So I've got B is 25 centimeters. I'm gonna do this in centimeters to the fourth so that we can change it into meters to the fourth at the end and everybody can see how I do that. Um, I like to you push that point home, that's for sure. So let's do that, B, H point, uh, or, or five centimeters cubed over 12 plus the cross-sectional area of that bottom part, which is 125 square centimeters times the distance to the centroid. So the centroid is at 12.2, right? And the centroid of this is at 2.5. So 12.2 minus 2.5 is 9.7 centimeters, and that quantity is squared. So that takes care of number one. Now, plus, let's do number two. Well, we need BH cubed over 12 first, don't we? So B is going to be 5 centimeters. H is going to be 20 centimeters cubed over 12. And then plus the cross-sectional area of that, which is 100 square centimeters, times the distance from its centroid, which would be at 15, to the centroid of the composite beam. So that's 15 minus 12.2, and that gives me 2.8 centimeters squared. Plus, let's do the last one now, the very top one, the base is going to be 15 centimeters. And then the uh, height is five centimeters over 12 plus the area, 75 square centimeters uh, times the distance from that centroid. So that centroid is going to be up at uh, 27.5 right, 27.5, 30 is the very top, and then 2.5 from that is 27.5. So 27.5 minus 12.2 is 15.3 centimeters. And of course, that is squared. Uh, I actually did this all in inches, so <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I, I, I switched these things around and everything. But so I actually haven't uh, come up with I total here, but we are going to come up with uh, um, I total. Let's see if I did get, uh, da, da. well, I got it in inches to the fourth, but that's not going to uh, really help us. So let's put this uh, all together so that we can get I total and then solve this problem and, and then we've got two more lectures after this. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna do the numbers. 25 times five to the third divided by 12 plus 125 times 9.7 squared 
equals 12,021. So 12,021 centimeters to the fourth. All right, plus, let's do the next one. So it's five times 20 cubed divided by 12 plus 100 times 2.8 squared equals 4,117 centimeters to the fourth plus uh, 15 times five cubed divided by 12 plus 75 times 15.3 squared equals. Now you're supposed to be doing this along with me, right? Uh, in class, you would be uh, doing this and I would be randomly calling on somebody to answer this question. So uh, I total, let's get that first. Uh, I'm just gonna add these together. And I get 33,851 centimeters to the fourth. But you know, we can't use that, can we? Right, 100 centimeters in one meter. I gotta take that to the fourth, don't I? Because it's centimeters to the fourth. So I've gotta take my conversion factor to the fourth too. So that's 10 to the two to the fourth, that would be 10 to the eight. So uh, 33, oops, just a second. Um, divided by one exponent eight equals 338.51 times 10 to the minus six meters to the fourth. Now, um, you're saying, well, why, why am I doing that? I've got y max equals 17.8. You know, I really should, should say that y max equals 0.178 meters, shouldn't I? And then we've got I total here. So now uh, we've got everything in meters to the fourth. And then I've got this in uh, uh, meters, right? So why don't I turn 5.925 uh, times 10 to the six foot pounds into that? Let's do that. Uh, 5.925 times 10 to the six foot pounds. Right? So if I was going to change those, I'd get rid of feet. So 3.28 feet equals one meter. And then don't I want to uh, get rid of pounds? So I know that 4.45 Newtons, oh got it, 4.45 Newtons, equals one pound. Oh, snuck it in there. <laughs> so pounds uh, and feet are gone and newtons and meters are uh, showing up. So 5.925 exponent six divided by 3.28 times 4.45 gives me 8.5. Oh, three, eight, five. I'll take it out to five significant digits, and that's going to be times 10 to the six Newton meters or joules, right? Foot pounds turns into Newton meters, but Newton meters we know is joules, so we, uh, we, we have the, the bending moment too. So we can figure out what our maximum uh, normal stress is, M, y over i, m max times y max over i, m max is going to be uh, 8.0385 times 10 to the six joules. Y max in, uh, is going to be 0.178 meters. 
And then I is uh, 338.51 times 10 to the minus six meters to the fourth. All right, let's punch those into our equation. Uh, and I get 4.227 times 10 to the nine. That can't be, is that right? 4.227 times 10 to the nine Pascals. Well, how many of those beams are we going to need to support this? I'm gonna keep that right in the middle there. If we know that our, we've got a safety factor of four and we're using steel, and the steel that we're using in there is gonna be 400 megapascals. So let's say that for the steel, it's 400 megapascals, right? And we're going to use a safety factor of four. So we're gonna to design to 100 megapascals. How many are we going to need in there? So if I have that divided by 100 megapascals, that tells me that I need 42.27 or 43 beams. 43 beams in parallel to hold up that type of loading. If we're designing, right, the design stress is going to be 100 megapascals. So we need 43 beams. Uh, if we were just designing to this, how many beams would we need if we were just using the steel? Well, we'd need one fourth or, or about 11 beams, wouldn't we? But of course, if we did that and something happened that we could foresee, like a lot of people on this bridge, that would have been bad too. All right, I've taken you past the, the 35 minutes or so. These last three lectures, I'm trying to get a lot in. So thank you and see you at the next lecture.